Hello! There are a few things I would like to briefly discuss before we dive in. First, I would like to thank each of you for attending this talk. I hope that God will work through my words to give you inspiration for your spiritual journey. I would also like to extend a thanks to those who recruited me to be a speaker for this event. It is an honor to be given the opportunity to share what my faith has looked like throughout my life. I would like to start us in prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord my God, thank you that you are the light of the world, guiding my steps on your path. Your word says that if I trust in you with all my heart and do not lean on my understanding, submitting to you in all my ways, then you will make my path straight. Guide my words, thoughts, and deeds. You are able to do far more abundantly than all I, that I ask or imagine, according to the power at, within me. To you be glory throughout all generations, forever and ever. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. It is currently January 25th. While you are at home, or at least in Waterloo, I am back at university, most likely in my dorm, getting acquainted with my coursework and, coursework and already studying away. Today was my first day back at school from a long two-month break, starting at Thanksgiving and ending this morning. My true home, though, is in Waterloo. I attended Cedar Valley Catholic schools my whole life, going to St. Edwards Elementary, then the middle school BMAP, and finally graduating from Columbus High. There is a disclaimer that I want to share with you all. I do not know your personal stories in Catholicism, but I can assume that each of you have had your highs and lows. I, too, have experienced this. There have been definite ebbs and flows in my journey with God, and while I have not completely fallen away from the church, neither have I had any profound spiritual awakenings. I think many of you can probably identify with me on this. The insights I want to share with you today have not come from any epiphanies in my mere 18 years of life, but rather they have been revealed to me by God through saints, speakers, teachers, religious people, friends, and ordinary experiences. Although I am quite young, I hope my relatively small amount of life experience can be of use to you in your faith journey. After all, we are all rooted together in the body of Christ, made by God with souls that are distinct yet still have a fundamental desire for something greater than this world. I would like to share my own experience with this yearning in my heart. I previously mentioned that I am a college student. I am sure many of you can think back to those days, whether it was decades ago or only a few years, because it is such a unique time in your life. It's the intersection of intense studying, deciding your future career, joining clubs, spending time with friends, attempting to stay financially afloat, and trying to form your identity as an individual away from your family. In the midst of it all, some of you may have tried to cling to your faith without being distracted by worldly things. You encounter things such as success, failure, happiness, desperation, and friendship. As a young adult, you begin to understand these in a different way through your life experiences. Right now, I am comfortably situated in the middle of this chaos. There have been some tough times, but I believe I have adjusted well. The coursework that I am studying is interesting and the right fit for me. I have become an active member in a number of groups on campus, and two of my best friends from home accompanied me to Iowa State, and I have found more since being there. Despite this, there has been some restlessness in my heart. During this past semester, I have dived deeper into my faith than I ever have. I've become an active member of St. Thomas Aquinas, the campus Catholic Church. I've joined a female small group where I've already found close friends, attended a book club, and consistently went to Mass multiple times each week. It might seem odd that taking a deep dive into my faith would make my heart feel uneasy. One would think there would be profound peace and joy. Instead, it uncovered my eyes to the stark contrast between the things of this world and those of God. When society says one thing, our faith oftentimes says another. It is difficult to live out this truth, though, when we are surrounded by people or work in organizations that have their heads in the things of this world. And it is even more tough when our own hearts naturally slide away from truth. This tug of war between this world and the next has been weighing on my heart for the past couple of years, as I have been maturing into a young adult. Although I may have a hard time accepting it, I know that I need to view things from a heavenly pr perspective rather than one from this side of eternity. We first belong to God as his children, and we are merely residents on this earth while we are waiting to return home. The book of Philippians reminds us that our citizenship is in heaven, and Colossians encourages us to seek what is above, where Christ is seated, not of what is on earth. This has become an important topic for me as I face the world. I do not want to fall for the false promises and pursue something that I know will not lead me back home to the Father. 
The overarching message of this talk is centered on my pursuit to change my perspective and adopt a new understanding of reality in accordance with the Catholic faith. The word I would like to focus on is shift. I was inspired by the priest at my home parish, Father Bullock, to look up the origin of the word, as he often shares his own research in his homilies. In the most modern sense, it of course means to move from one place to another. Historically, it is also meant to separate from, divide, and dispose. Shifting my perspective, then, does not only represent committing to something new, but also abandoning my old understandings and doing so in the most intentional way. I have identified three ways that I must shift in order to step into the heavenly citizenship mentioned in Philippians. First, I realize that I must change my reactions to frustrating situations or those that require me to sacrifice something for the sake of another. There have been countless times where one small incident is the end of the world to me, or I throw the needs of others to the wayside if it intrudes on my life. This has especially been present to me as a young adult, as I increasingly make more of my own decisions and find myself in tough, grown-up situations. The only way I was able to identify this tendency, though, was through the grace of God starting in April of 2016, the spring of my 8th grade year. This saving grace was in the form of my mother and grandmother. Nine days after moving into a fixer-upper that my mom was eager to start on, she received a desperate call from her own mother, saying that she had fallen and needed her immediate help. My grandmother, who was only a few weeks away from turning 89, had suffered a stroke. Over the next four and a half years, she would move from her home to the hospital, to a nursing home, and then to two separate assisted living facilities. While she kept the majority of her mental and physical faculty faculties after this incident, she was in no state to be still living by herself without additional care. It was confusing and uncomfortable for her to bounce around from place to place, and it was evident whenever we saw her, whether it was in the way she sat or the look she gave or the comments that she made. I tried to put myself in her shoes. I imagine that she was probably frustrated not being able to do whatever she wanted, as she was largely confined to a chair all day and only able to watch TV or read a book. Although I saw the pain that my grandmother was enduring, the pressure that I had put on my mom was much more evident to me. My mother is as strong as they come. For two decades, she has been raising a family, keeping the house in order, pursuing her own passions, and working a full-time job where she is head honcho. Basically, superwoman. But for anyone who has ever cared for one or both of their parents, you have an intimate understanding of how exhausting it is. My mother was no exception to this. In the beginning, she had to clear out my grandmother's house, put it up for sale, organize everything she owned, and move her out all at the same time. Every week after that, she grocery shopped for her, kept track of her money, visited her, and took her to doctor's appointments. My mother truly lived out God's command to honor your mother and father. These two women, whom I loved and had given me everything, were not who they once were. As I noticed how much they had changed, I, not I took notice that something was changing in me, too. One question that had really never been at the forefront of my mind kept coming up. What could I do to help? In hindsight, I can tell that this was God speaking into my heart. It was Him pulling me out of my immature, selfish ways and into a new practice of serving someone other than myself. I tried to put myself in their shoes and feel the weight that was on each of them. I could see the beauty in putting some of that weight on my shoulders in order to lighten their load. So, I began to accompany my mother on her weekend errands, which included visiting my grandmother. In the beginning, it was tough. I didn't feel like sacrificing a good portion of my Saturday to run around town. Over time, though, I noticed how my grandma looked forward to me coming, and how she was interested to hear about someone's life outside of her uneventful assisted living facility. I could also tell how much my mother enjoyed having me with her. It would have been much more burdensome and lonely without someone by her side. And I realized that this was an invaluable time to spend with these two women, as my grandmother was closing in on the end of her life, and I would be going away to college in a few years and wouldn't see my mother nearly as much. After diving deeper into my faith in the coming years, I realized that this was one of the major shifts I needed to undertake to live like I belonged in heaven rather than on earth. I had to put myself in another person's shoes instead of focusing on myself. Shifting your perspective and loving someone else in this way does not need to be as dramatic as my experience was. There are moments every single day to love one another. It could be taking someone out to lunch, giving them a kind word, doing an extra chore, making dinner, or driving them somewhere. The size of your gesture doesn't matter either. St. Therese of Lisieux wisely reminded us that our Lord does not so much look at the greatness of our actions or even at their difficulty as at the love with which we do them. She herself was a master of doing these little acts. She also said that 
When one loves, one does not calculate. There is no price on love, nor is there any amount of sacrifice that is not worth what love ultimately gives. This winter break has helped me to realize the next shift that I need to make in order to adopt a more heavenly perspective. If you're anything like me, you're sick of this pandemic. In one way or another, it has taken a toll on each of us. By this point, we're all too familiar with the quarantine orders. Stay at home as much as possible and limit your exposure to other people. As the months dragged on, some tension definitely grew between the members of my family. This is inevitable when you're stuck at home with the same people during a pandemic. We were all thoroughly tired of each other, and things became better when my older sister and I went away to college in the fall. Over this winter break, it has been better, but some of the tension arose once again. Taking this situation and somehow making it better seems impossible. Jokingly, I wonder, do you kick someone out, bring someone new in, do you each go to your own corners of the house and only see each other at specific times? I've learned that the answer to all these questions is no. St. Teresa of Lisieux taught me a different method, her little way. On the surface, she was an unremarkable young French nun who simply did her duties around the convent. Deep down, though, she had an intimate connection with the Lord and knew the secret of getting to heaven. She realized that you must come to understand your smallness and unconditionally love one another. There were no exceptions to her little way, even when she was in a difficult situation or had to deal with frustrating people. In fact, she saw those very moments as the most valuable time to challenge herself to love. This is the extraordinary part of her that I want to highlight. In the convent, there was constant tension between herself and another sister. She wrote in her autobiography, Story of a Soul, that this sister just had a knack of rubbing her up the wrong way at every turn. Has anyone ever rubbed you the wrong way? I know someone sure has for me, and I can assure you that my actions do not align with what she did. Here's a quote from the book that details how St. Therese reacted to, the, to her hostile feelings. I determined to treat this sister as if she were the person I loved best in the world. Every time I met her, I used to pray for her, offering to God all her virtues and her merits. Stopping just right there, she shows an incredible ability to love her neighbor, even when she would most likely rather talk about her behind her back or let it silently stew within her. However, she goes on to talk about how she did not stop here in this challenge to love. I didn't confine myself to saying a lot of prayers for her. I tried to do her every good turn I possibly could. When I felt tempted to take her down with an unkind retort, I would put on my best smile instead and try and change the subject. Others took notice of Teresa's kindness to this person too. Her two biological sisters, who were both nuns at the same convent, were under the impression the whole time that Teresa and this particular sister were best friends. Why was St. Teresa so willing to do this? She wrote that what really attracted her about this particular sister was Jesus hidden in the depths of her soul. She went on to say that Jesus, who fashions men's souls so skillfully, doesn't want us to stand about admiring the facade. He wants us to make our way in. She did not linger on her annoyance, but instead pursued a higher path of love. Looking over my own life, I know that I have been cruel towards someone far more often than I have been merciful like Therese. It doesn't diminish the fact, though, that unconditionally loving one another is what God is calling each of us to do. No amount of frustration, heartbreak, or anger could excuse us from loving. Therese had an intimate understanding of this. While dealing with the particular sister that aggravated her, she reminded herself that charity isn't a matter of fine sentiments. It means doing things. She set aside her feelings and focused on who was actually in front of her, a child of God with a handcrafted soul as worthy of loving as anyone else. With the help of Therese, I've been able to see how I can still love someone despite conflict. My understanding of how to react to difficult situations and people has shifted to a more heavenly perspective. You can use them instead to challenge yourself to love others in a new way. Therese gives her own witness to the power of this transformational love. As she wrote, Jesus makes the bitterest mouthful taste sweet. She has helped me conclude that you can and must choose to love because no matter what the circumstances are or who you are dealing with, you are ultimately loving God. There is one more shift that I need to make in order to leave the things of this world and fully embrace a more heavenly perspective. In high school and in college, a grade is put on almost everything that you do. Even in competitive clubs and sports, you're measured by a certain score or a time. Our world thinks that an A, a gold medal, and the best time is what defines success, and anything other than that is a failure. 
This upbringing has definitely been difficult for the perfectionist side of me in school, and I can imagine that it doesn't get any easier as you grow up. As I look to my future career, financial situation, and general goals, I think in terms of these types of success and failure. I think that if I don't meet a certain benchmark, then all of my efforts will be in vain. The world has misconstrued other concepts too. Our social life is about, having, is about showing off how many friends we have, not the depth of those relationships. Love has turned into something that must be tang tangibly expressed with gifts and money rather than an intimate connection. And health is not how we feel on the inside, but what we look like on the outside. I have come to understand, though, that our faith takes a much different approach to these topics. How do we succeed according to God? First Kings tells us to walk in his ways and keep his decrees and commands so that you may prosper in all you do and wherever you go. What does friendship look like according to our faith? First Th Thessalonians commands us to encourage one another and build one another up. And Proverbs, Proverbs reminds us that the sweetness of a friend comes from his earnest counsel. What about the way we look? Corinthians tells us that our bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit. And First Timothy points out that while bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way. How are we supposed to love? Paul's famous passage in 1 Corinthians says that love is patient and kind. It does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. As I go through college, I will deal with success, failure, friendships, health, and love frequently, and I want to live according to what God says will satisfy my heart. This means that I must shift my understandings of those things and redefine them in light of our faith. God's expectations are not the world's. He established the reality of who we are, how we function, and what our souls truly need. The world did not. These three shifts that I want to make in my life, stepping into another person's shoes and serving them, loving others no matter how frustrating a situation or person, and redefining concepts in my life to align with what our faith teaches are ongoing challenges for me. God has invited each and every one of us into his kingdom, and we must act like we belong there by choosing him every day. The behaviors and promises of this life will not fulfill or carry us over into eternity. I believe that no matter what stage you are at, you can make these shifts in your life as well, for it is not by your own efforts, but through Christ. Matthew's Gospel reminds us that with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. I would like to end with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. God my Father, may I love you in all things and above all things. May I reach the joy which you have prepared for me in heaven. Nothing is good that is against your will, and all that is good comes from your hand. Place in my heart a desire to please you and fill my mind with thoughts of your love, so that I may grow in your wisdom and enjoy your peace. Amen.